Hello? Hello. This is Dr. Smith's office. Is this Wendy? Yes. Your pregnancy test is positive. Congratulations, dear. Call us back next week and we'll set up a time for you to see the doctor. Bye now. <gasps> yes! All right! I can't believe it! Wow! Oh. Wow. Feeling a bit overwhelmed? Uh-huh. You're about to find out the answers to a lot of your questions. On Pregnancy for Dummies. I think she kicked me. Gloria, you know right now the baby's having the hiccups. The giggles is a new one for me. That one I haven't heard. Right here. White circle? Yeah. That's the lens of her eye. Really? Wow. Here's your number one rescuer. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you that cutie pie? Oh god, he's so cute. Gorgeous. There's a lot of dreams and hopes and and you think about what is this child going to be like. It's uh, it's just um, a lot of dreams in there. So it's it's a very magical time. Dr. Joanne Stone and Dr. Keith Edelman are partners in this busy New York OBGYN practice. They're also the authors of the book, Pregnancy for Dummies. In this program, they'll lead you through what to expect during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, which is called the first trimester. What symptoms will you be experiencing? I'm very nauseous. What tests will you need? What things should you avoid? And what can you enjoy? And speaking of enjoyment, you know you're in good hands because the doctors who wrote this book love their work. In medical school, you rotate through internal medicine and surgery and pediatrics and things like that. And as soon as I got into OB, that's just what I loved. I would just stay up all night, I'd hang out with the midwives doing deliveries, and I just knew that that was what I wanted to do. The one thing I knew when I went to medical school that I absolutely didn't want to do was OBGYN. And that was one of my first clinical rotations as a third year medical student, and I was just completely smitten with it. It was so fascinating to me. Along with Dr. Stone and Dr. Edelman, you'll meet Wendy. Hi, Wendy. She may remind you of someone you know. Yourself, maybe? She's a woman who was in control of her life, confident, and rather opinionated. That is, before she got pregnant. Now her body is going through a mysterious process without consulting her. She buys pregnancy book after pregnancy book, and all that information is overwhelming. Then she finds Pregnancy for Dummies. Look, she's feeling better already. We wrote this book and made this television series so that we can provide women who are pregnant with good, accurate medical information, and also to put into perspective some of the information that they've heard from other sources. And by the way, we know you're not dumb, but some of the information that you get about pregnancy can make you feel that way sometimes. We really, really think that pregnancy should not be scary. Pregnancy should really be fun. To help guide you through the show, you'll see icons, just like in the For Dummies books. They'll help clarify or highlight key information like things in pregnancy that are particularly important to remember, or the countless things in pregnancy that you don't need to worry about. Congratulations. What's the first thing you should do when you find out you're pregnant? Well, after you shout for joy or cringe and panic, you'll need to find a doctor. In general, there are four different types of practitioners that deliver babies. The one that I think most women go to is a general OBGYN. That's a doctor that has a special training in obstetrics and gynecology. The next type would be a maternal fetal medicine doctor. That's someone who's done a, a training in a general obstetrics and gynecology, but they've also done training in high-risk pregnancies. And then another type of practitioner is a nurse midwife. It's a nurse that also has training in taking care of pregnant women and delivering babies. In general, I think women that go to a nurse midwife tend to be a little bit lower risk. And then the fourth type would be a family practitioner. These are doctors who take care of men, women, and children. They're trained to take care of families throughout their lives, and, which includes obstetrics. The important thing, though, is to be comfortable with the person that you've chosen, regardless of the type of practitioner they are, somebody that you feel comfortable going to with your problems and concerns. Oh, look at all the babies. We'll find your picture. Come on in here, Robin. Oh, there's Robin. Oh, 
Robin is coming to see Dr. Stone for her first appointment. As you can see, she's working on baby number two. But don't think just because she's been pregnant before, she knows all the answers. Each pregnancy is unique and comes with its own set of considerations. <laughs> first prenatal visit. I'm eight weeks pregnant, and I'm feeling okay. <laughs> Quite nauseous, but feeling okay. So you've made it to your first appointment. What should you expect? Well, for starters, you'll have to weigh in. While it's normal for most women to gain weight in their first trimester, you might not be prepared for the initial shock. That is so not true. <laughs> That is not true. It's not possible. <laughs> They'll also take your blood pressure, a urine sample, and ouch, draw some blood. This will help your doctor find any signs of problems that could affect the health of you or your baby. After that, you'll receive a routine gynecological exam. Your doctor will also ask you a lot of questions at that first appointment. No, she's not prying. She's just trying to get the kind of information she needs to give you the best medical care. So when she asks you about your lifestyle, gynecological history, and family background, give her the whole story. No family history of any mental retardation, Down syndrome, anybody born with any congenital heart defects or anything, spina bifida? No. Not in your no. family. And your ethnic background? I always ask patients about their ethnic background, not because I'm being nosy, but because there's certain genetic diseases that are more common among different populations. So for example, Robin and her husband are both Jewish. So we would screen them for certain diseases like Tay-Sachs disease or Gachet's disease. If a patient is African American or Italian or Greek, there are other diseases that we would test for also. At that first appointment, you'll also get an answer to your most burning question. Just how pregnant are you? A lot of what we do depends on how far along somebody is. There are certain tests that are done at specific time periods. So we have a little wheel and we put in the patient's first day of the last menstrual period and that gives us what we call the gestational age in weeks. And that puts your due date March 10th. I always discuss with patients the different prenatal tests that are available to make sure that the fetus is okay. And basically there are two different types of tests non-invasive tests, for example, blood tests or ultrasound, that can help screen for certain problems in a fetus. Those tests aren't 100% diagnostic, but they're good for screening for problems. Then there are invasive tests, like a CVS or amniocentesis, which will definitely detect chromosomal abnormalities in a fetus. However, with any invasive test, there's always a small risk of miscarriage associated with it. My feeling about it is that, you know, this is the information you guys can interpret this in the way that you want and then decide what you want to do. If you want to, if you say... Robin you know, and Stephen chose a non-invasive so test, invasive which will be done in several weeks. One of the most wonderful parts of that first visit okay. is listening to the baby's heartbeat. To do that, the doctor uses something called an electronic Doppler device. Sometimes, as with Robin, it's hard to pick up the heartbeat so early in a pregnancy. In that case, your doctor will use ultrasound, which can capture the heartbeat as early as six weeks. We'll always document that there's a heartbeat there that's really important at every OB visit. We make sure that we can show the mother that everything is going fine. When a patient hears a heartbeat for the first time, they're often surprised by the sound of it. Um, it's very fast. It's normally between about 120 and 160, although it could go just a little bit higher. So people aren't used to that really quick heartbeat because that's twice what our normal heart rate is. All right, Robin, it looks great. So you're all set. Great. It's wonderful. It's, uh, it's, it's good because it's, it's proof, you know, when the first couple of weeks, there's no physical signs because she's not getting bigger. So it's good to come in and actually see something. It makes it more real. Makes it more exciting. I can't even talk. It's awesome. It's the best. Relief. <laughs> I often just hold my belly, or Stephen will snuggle at night and hold my belly, and just and I know what's going through our minds. Is this baby is growing because of us, and it's amazing. I, I I can't even describe it more than that because it's just 
it's a miracle. A lot of people in the first visit will say, well, when can I tell my friends or what can I tell my family that I'm pregnant? And they have the, in their mind, at the end of the first trimester is really the best time to start to tell people. The fact is that they really can tell people after the heartbeat is detected. After a heartbeat is seen, a normal heart rate is seen, the risk of miscarriage drops down to about three to five percent. We're calling to uh, let you know that we are pregnant. Oh my gosh. Isn't that great? So we're excited. We're due in March. Oh, I'm so excited for you. Once you've started spreading the good news, don't be surprised if you begin to get some rather odd advice from family, friends, and even strangers. Isn't that great? Old wives' tales have been carefully handed down for generations. And believe me, there's a reason they're called old wives' tales. Listen to this. Presenting 10 old wives' tales in order of absurdity. Number 10, the spicy food fraud. Eating spicy food will bring on labor. Well, you can try it, but it won't work. Number nine, the fetal heart rate fallacy. If your baby's fetal heart rate is low, it's a boy. If it's high, you're carrying a girl. Not so. Number eight, the you can't be too careful yarn. If a pregnant woman lifts her hands above her head or steps over a rope, she'll choke the baby. Give me a break. Number seven, the steamy sex superstition. Making mad, passionate love will bring on labor. It's really not true. Sex is not going to um, cause you to go into labor. But we tell people, go ahead and have a good time anyway. It's worth trying. Number six, the old heartburn harangue. The oldest one in the book. If a pregnant woman experiences frequent heartburn, her baby will have a full head of hair. What? Number five, the sty in the eye lie. Anyone who denies a pregnant woman the food she craves will get a sty in their eye. Well, you don't want to get in the way of a pregnant woman and her cravings, but the sty is a lie. Number four, the ugly stick trick. If a pregnant woman sees something ugly or horrible, she'll have an ugly baby. That one's wrong on two, two counts. One is there's no scientific evidence, but number two is that there's no such thing as an ugly baby. Number three, the old Java jive. If a baby is born with light brown birthmarks, known as cafe au lait spots, the mother drank too much coffee or had unfulfilled cravings during her pregnancy. Again, it's a myth. Number two, the gender bender. Everyone knows this one. If you carry wide, it's a girl. If you carry forward, it's a boy. It's a common one, but it's not true. Not true. And now, for the number one old wives tale, the poor complexion connection. If your face breaks out, you're carrying a girl because a girl will steal all her mother's beauty. Now that's just me. The thing about it is that it's so chauvinistic. Why is it that a girl is going to steal her mother's beauty and a, and a boy isn't? I mean, anyway, it's not true. It's ridiculous. Take advice from your friends with a grain of salt. But when it comes to the advice from your doctor, you really should listen up. Anybody that um, is thinking about having a child or women who are maybe not actively trying but are not using birth control should be taking a vitamin with folic acid. It's been discovered over the last several years that folic acid is very important in the reduction of an abnormality called neural tube defects. A neural tube defect is an abnormality in the closure, basically, of the spine and the spinal cord. And this problem with the closure occurs very early in a pregnancy, around five to six weeks. And what's been found is that by supplementing with folic acid, you can reduce the incidence of these neural tube defects. Now that you know how crucial that first appointment with your doctor is, and just how ridiculous some people's advice might be, we can move on to other important aspects of the first trimester. Coming up next on Pregnancy for Dummies. My breasts are growing and my waistline is gone. From headaches to heartburn, all those weird and wonderful changes to your body. Hey, 
Hey, Wendy, how are you feeling? Well, my breasts feel like watermelons. I'm nauseous. I'm tired. I have headaches. I'm hungry all the time. I'm constipated. I'm bloated. And I have to go to the bathroom constantly. Boy, are you feeling pregnant. Very. Body changes. Ah, yes. That feeling that your body isn't quite your own anymore. You can expect a whole range of physical and emotional changes during the first trimester. Hey, remember Robin? We met her and her daughter Rachel at her first OB appointment. She was pretty nauseous then, and she's pretty nauseous now. The first time I was pregnant, I would be nauseous in the morning, and then I would go to work, and I would try to be the best I possibly could, and then I would drive home, and I would be able to lay on the couch in the dark with the TV on, a blanket over my eyes, and I was, fortunately enough, I could lay there all night long. This time around, being on my second pregnancy, it's much different. I wanted chocolate milk. I don't have time to be nauseous. I don't have time to worry about myself because Rachel's my priority. Caroline doesn't have that problem yet. This is her first pregnancy and she's carrying twins. Right now, she spends most of her time on the couch, which is a good thing because she won't get much rest once those two are born. I love this couch. It's been my best friend throughout this pregnancy because every day when I'm nauseous and I have a headache, this is where I sit. Me, the couch, and the TV, and I'm just the most comfortable on this couch. Every woman experiences pregnancy differently. Some have loads of physical and emotional symptoms, from dizziness to mood swings. A fortunate few breeze right through without any symptoms at all. For Veronica, who is pregnant with her third child, nausea is not an issue. Her expanding waistline is. My body's going through so many changes. My breasts are growing, and my waistline is gone. <sighs> the symptoms that I'm having are uh, nausea, lots of it. I've become so much more sensitive now that I'm pregnant. Sometimes I get dizzy spells. And it's just all, all day long. I find myself crying over silly things. I feel like I have the flu, but I know I don't. I'm constantly hungry and always craving something sweet. My chest has gotten much larger, so I'm very self-conscious of it. Of course, Stephen's very happy. My breasts ache like you wouldn't believe, something that's never happened to me before. I didn't even know I had breasts before. <laughs> it's like, in a way, like an alien has invaded my body. Wow all these symptoms, but why? In the first trimester, your body's undergoing just so many changes. Uh, there are different hormones that are increasing. Um, your body's changing in, in weight. Your, your blood circulatory volume is changing. There's so many different changes that they cause different symptoms, and, and that's, why, that's why they occur in the first trimester, because the changes are most uh, marked in the first trimester compared to the other two. If you find that you don't have any symptoms, that's totally normal and consider yourself lucky. And if you find that you're plagued with every symptom in the book, that's normal too. By now, you might be wondering, is there no relief? When you're nauseous, the first thing to do is just try to eat some small, frequent meals. So get a little bit of food in every few hours. Stick to foods that you really feel like eating, crackers, toast, things like that. You can try ginger, that's been shown to be useful. And also, if it gets very severe, ask your doctor about prescription medications because they're safe and they really can help. If you have a headache, you can take Tylenol. It's completely safe to take during pregnancy. I would avoid aspirin because it can affect the body's ability to clot blood. Um, also, you can try a cold compress on your head. Sometimes that works as well. The key to constipation is preventing it. So lots of fluid, foods with bran, fruit, and you can take stool softeners um, also, that'll help. If you find that your breasts are really swollen and, and are tender, just buy some really good supportive bras that fit. You may find that you're going through a series of bras in different sizes throughout the pregnancy, but that's about the only thing you can do. Okay, 
Now that you know how to handle the symptoms, what do you do about your concerns? We're talking about your baby. Of course you're going to worry. Pregnancy is a mixture of a zillion emotions going on at one time. Well, I have no waste. I'm, at times I'm very excited, and at other times I'm very nervous. At times I get scared, is everything okay? You hear all these stories that, oh, you're not supposed to use hair dye and this and that, and, and it scares you. Looking at what you use and consume in a whole new way? Can any of this stuff harm my baby? What about hair dye? Is it okay? There's no data to show that the most products that are used now on the market are harmful at all. In the past, some of the products contain formaldehyde and, and even arsenic, and obviously those are products that we know are not good for us. Most products now don't contain those compounds. What about a perm? Perming your hair is perfectly fine during pregnancy. There was some uh, concern years ago about perming your hair, but there's been no studies at all to show that um, a hair perm causes any sort of defect in the fetus or is any problem at all. How about leg waxing? Definitely. It does not cause any problem for the fetus, and they should feel good and be happy and be hair free. How about a manicure? Having your nails done is completely fine. You just want to make sure that you do it in a place that's um, reputable, that, that sterilizes equipment appropriately. And you also want to make sure that the area is well ventilated so that you're not breathing chemicals for a prolonged period of time. Please tell me it's all right to have a massage. We usually tell patients for massages just to be careful that they're not really rubbing your belly that hard to, to cause contractions. But it's really perfectly fine to do. And in fact, some insurance companies will pay for pregnancy massages. And they have some tables with cutouts for the belly, which is great. So it's fine. Now this is a biggie, to travel or not to travel. The only thing about traveling really that's, that's risky is that it separates you from the person who has been rendering your prenatal care, who knows you best really from the standpoint of your pregnancy. Um, you certainly shouldn't travel late in pregnancy when there's a likelihood that you might go into labor and deliver. What about those metal detectors? Metal detectors don't use ionizing radiation, which is the kind of x-rays that you have when you have a, a chest x-ray. So those are completely um, safe for the baby and don't pose a harm to you either. Once you're in the air, just make sure that you drink a lot of water because you tend to become dehydrated in a plane. And also make sure that you get up and walk around every couple of hours to keep blood from pooling in your legs to try to prevent you from getting a blood clot. Are seat belts safe for your baby? It's a common misconception that seat belts are made for non-pregnant people and that a seat belt can actually harm a pregnant belly. That's not true. Um, the baby's surrounded by amniotic fluid. That amniotic fluid provides an excellent sort of shock absorber and cushion. You should wear the seat belt below your belly, in other words, below the, the pregnant uterus, not across the belly, and then the shoulder harness should be at the normal place. But you should not um, avoid wearing a seat belt while you're pregnant just because you're worried that it might hurt the baby. That's not the case at all. Any worries about what's okay to eat and drink? For the most part, pregnant women can eat just about anything, but there are certain foods that we tell them to look out for or to try to avoid. Very soft cheeses or unpasteurized cheeses, uh, the raw milk cheese, um, that has been associated with containing, in very rare cases, um, a bacteria called Listeria, which can be associated with miscarriage or preterm labor. There has been some concern over the level of methylmercury in certain fish. And those fish in particular are swordfish, tilefish, kingfish, and there's a question about tuna that's still very controversial. The story with sushi is it's really no more dangerous to eat sushi when you're pregnant than it is when you're not pregnant. However, with raw meat or with pate, um, that they can carry an increased risk of toxoplasmosis, which is something that can affect the fetus. You may have been told by some misinformed friends to give up your morning cup of coffee. Well, relax. They're wrong. We tell patients that up to two caffeinated beverages a day is fine. Beyond that is associated with an increased risk of miscarriage or um, the baby not growing well. But up to two is fine, so you don't have to absolutely stop all caffeine. Worried about prescription medication? Most prescription medications are perfectly safe to take during pregnancy. There are some, however, that can have a potential risk to the fetus. So you should definitely talk to your doctor and go over your medications because he or she may want to switch you to a medication that's more suitable for pregnancy. 
Most over-the-counter medications are perfectly fine to take, for example, Tylenol or cough syrup, but you might want to check with your doctor first. Are hot tubs safe? Hot tubs are fine during pregnancy. You just want to limit your exposure to less than 10 minutes. Um, the key is that you don't, want, you don't want your body temperature to get above 102, and it's very unlikely that if you stay there less than 10 minutes that it's really going to get up to 102. Now, don't let that stop you from soaking your body in a nice, soothing bath. Just go easy on the hot water. While you can relax about most of the things you do and most foods you eat, there are some areas where you really do need to proceed with caution. A lot of people ask about drinking during pregnancy. We usually tell our patients that having an occasional glass of wine, maybe one time a week, is probably fine. There's definitely um, studies that show that uh, chronic use of alcohol can be associated with something called fetal alcohol syndrome, and usually that's more than two drinks a day. There's definitely no absolute lower limit of what's safe, but sort of common sense will tell us that an occasional drink is probably fine. A lot of people come on their first OB visit and they say, well, before I knew I was pregnant, I had, you know, five margaritas when I was, you know, on vacation. And that one episode will probably not cause any problem. Do we really need to ask this one? I mean, unless you've been living on Mars, you have got to know that smoking is not good for you or your baby. We know that smoking throughout the entire pregnancy decreases the birth weight of the baby by about a half of a pound. The two most harmful components of cigarette smoke are carbon monoxide and nicotine. Carbon monoxide decreases the amount of oxygen that gets to the baby, um, and nicotine reduces the actual blood flow to the, the, the uterine arteries, which ultimately go to the baby. If there was ever a time to kick the habit, this is it. If you can quit smoking during pregnancy, especially early during the first trimester, then the, the effects of smoking on fetal growth are really minimized or maybe not even be an issue at all. So there is an advantage to stopping while you're pregnant. So far, in the all-important first trimester, we've seen how to relieve your most uncomfortable symptoms, and you've got a good idea of what to enjoy and what to avoid. When Pregnancy for Dummies returns, we're going to help you get through something that might feel well, a little intimidating, prenatal testing. I don't think I'm really nervous about the procedure. I'm more nervous about the results. But don't worry, Pregnancy for Dummies is here to help. Hey, Wendy, what happened? You're looking pretty blue. Still nauseous? No, it's not that. It's prenatal testing. It makes me worry about all the things that could go wrong. True enough, but you could think about it another way. Yeah? Prenatal testing can help you and your baby. Odds are you're both doing just fine. I hope so. Carolina spent most of her first trimester on the couch, coping with some pretty severe symptoms. But after years of infertility treatments, she's finally pregnant with you guessed it, twins. Yeah, Jackson Court. Madison, I've always liked Madison for a girl. Yeah, but I don't like Madison but, for a boy. But it's so common, too, for a girl. That's why I like Jordan. After all that, she and her husband Herb figure they can handle just about anything, including prenatal testing. So they've decided to have a prenatal test early in pregnancy called a CVS. I don't think I'm really nervous about the procedure. I'm more nervous about the results. So, um... I've been nervous since I got up this morning. CVS, which stands for chorionic villus sampling, is a prenatal test that allows us to analyze the structure and the number of chromosomes in a fetus to make sure that there's no abnormality present. CVS can be done one of two ways. Either it's done vaginally or it's done through the mom's abdomen. In Carolyn's case, we ended up testing both fetuses through the abdomen. When you're doing the CVS, you're passing this needle through the skin, through the muscle of the uterus, and right into the placenta. You zoom up. You're going to feel a little cramp now, OK? On the screen, it looks maybe like there's a big area of placenta, but in actuality, it's fairly thin. So you have to be very, very careful that you're not putting the needle into the amniotic sac. And you watch with the ultrasound, and you follow the tip of the needle, which looks white on the ultrasound screen. And you're going carefully until you get right in the center of the placenta. Then you move the needle back and forth to sort of suction out that tissue.
How you doing? In a CVS, we're taking a sample of tissue from the placenta, not from the fetus, and analyzing it in the lab. You might wonder, how can the chromosomes in the placenta be the same as the ones in the fetus? Well, in fact, they are, because when the egg and sperm come together and start increasing, the cells start increasing in number, some cells become the placenta and some become the fetus, but they have the same chromosomes. So you can test the placenta, and that reflects the chromosomes of the fetus. There's a lot of tissue in there. There's another huge chunk there. There's a ton in there. Okay, I can do it. It's gorgeous. It was worse for me. It was worse for you. I think it's worse when you have to watch. It is. That wasn't so bad, but it's not over yet. Because Caroline is carrying twins, Dr. Stone has to do the procedure twice. One down, one down. Okay. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. You don't worry about me. If I fall on the floor, you just keep on going. Okay. <laughs> there really isn't any need to worry. Your doctor will be there every step of the way to guide you through the procedure. All right, instructions for today. Just take it easy. It's normal to feel a little crampy, almost like menstrual type cramps. That should subside over the next hour. Mm -hmm. um, you can take some Tylenol if you want to, okay? And um, some people have a little bit of spotting. Yeah, a little bit is okay. More than that, I want you to call me. Right. Okay, any high fever in the next 24 hours, call me. Okay. But I think you should be fine. Ah, now I'm relieved. <laughs> We're relieved now. You ready to go home? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Okay. Now that that's over, Caroline and Herb can relax, right? Well, not exactly. They have to wait five to 10 days for the test results. Why so long? because the sample has to be grown in the lab and incubated at just the right temperature before it can be analyzed under the microscope. All this takes time. While Caroline waits for her results, Robin, who is 11 weeks pregnant, has come for her prenatal test. She's brought her mother along for support. Today, it's difficult. It's in the back of my mind. I'm nervous because it's a test to see if there's something wrong with the child instead of something being happy that there's five fingers or that the heart beats there so it's a little nerve-wracking. Prenatal testing can be a bit nerve-wracking but more often than not the results end up being quite reassuring. Your genetics counselor will explain everything. Today on the sonogram, as you saw in the um, brochure, what they're going to do is look at a side profile of the fetus. And what they do Robin doesn't have to go through prenatal testing in the first trimester. She has volunteered to participate in a research project at Mount Sinai called the FASTER trial. The purpose of this trial is to find a better, non-invasive way to predict Down syndrome early in pregnancy. What Down syndrome is, is one specific type of mental retardation that's caused by an abnormal number of chromosomes in the baby's cells. It isn't something people have control over. And in 95% of cases, there's no family history. It's just an isolated um, occurrence. Age, however, can be a factor. The older you are, the higher the risk. Robin, how old will you be at delivery? 33. 33. Okay, so let's just get an idea here of, of where you're starting on this chart. So at 33, the risk uh, for any chromosome abnormality live born is about 1 in 280. And we usually estimate Down's cases make up about half of that, and that's about 1 in 600. As part of this study, Robin will have a special ultrasound to measure the thickness of an area in her baby's neck known as a nuchal translucency. It's been noted that fetuses with Down syndrome have a nuchal translucency that is thicker or wider than fetuses that don't have Down syndrome. You see this subtle little membrane back here? Mm -hmm. That's the nuchal translucency. This little thing right here that I'm measuring right from here to here is the nuchal, that, that space in between is the translucency oh, there. Okay. See how subtle that is? Mm -hmm. There's a, a large group in Great Britain that's done an extensive amount of work on the nuchal translucency. And what they claim is that by measuring the nuchal translucency in the first trimester, that they can detect as many as 80 to 90 percent of all fetuses that have Down syndrome in the first trimester, which is phenomenal. Robin will have to wait until her second trimester when she takes a standard blood test 
called a triple screen to find out the status of her baby. Now that we've gotten through prenatal testing, we'll move on to the changes your baby is undergoing in the womb. And the greatest mystery of all, is it a boy or a girl? Let's find out when Pregnancy for Dummies returns. While it's impossible to miss the changes going on with your body during pregnancy, it takes some special equipment to see what's happening with your babies. Pregnancy for Dummies will now take you inside the womb. Veronica, who is now 10 weeks pregnant with her third child, is having an ultrasound. So at about 10 weeks, you can start to make out some of the structures. You can see the head over here and the brain tissue, which is really important. You can start to see the spine developing. Now, you might be able to see a very large spinal defect or neural tube defect, but small ones you probably wouldn't be able to pick up just yet. The first time you see an ultrasound, it might look like nothing more than a big blur. But as your doctor points everything out, gradually the picture starts to become clear. You can see the umbilical cord inserting into the placenta. The black over here is fluid. Actually, whenever you see black on the ultrasound, that's usually fluid. It's usually some sort of fluid. Now, sometimes it can be blood. You know, within the umbilical cord, you can see that it's black. That's blood. And over here, this is fluid. This is the amniotic fluid. Did you say jump? Oh, yes. Look at that. It's moving. A lot of people don't realize that the fetuses can move. A little jumping bean. See, this is sort of stretching over there and moving its... So all these are normal, normal movements that a fetus of this gestational age can do. So it looks great. It looks perfect. You can tell a lot about your baby through the use of ultrasound, including whether you're having a boy or a girl. But during your pregnancy, you may hear a lot of other, uh, shall we say, less than scientific methods that are supposed to predict your baby's sex. So don't be surprised when someone approaches you with the Great Drano Hoax. This one is my favorite. First, you pour a tablespoon of Drano into the toilet. Then you have a pregnant woman urinate into it. If the water turns pink, she's carrying, you guessed it, a girl. If it turns blue, the baby is a boy. It's actually one that we hear about a lot. Um, about the only thing this will do will unclog your drain. The wild woman myth. If the woman initiated the sex that led to conception, the baby is a girl. Or if the woman was on top when the baby was conceived, it's a boy. Who makes this stuff up? Last but not least, the old spoon and fork fallacy. First, you place a spoon under one cushion of a sofa and a fork under another. Then you invite a pregnant woman to sit down. If she sits over the spoon, she's carrying a girl. If she sits over the fork, the baby is a boy. Okay. Sitting on a spoon or fork? I don't think so. Um, you can see... Now that we've learned how your baby grows in the first trimester and how not to predict your baby's sex, Next on Pregnancy for Dummies, we find out, along with Carolyn and Herb, the results of their prenatal test. What if wrong, something's wrong with one and not the other? And, oh, God, my head just hasn't stopped since I got You'll up this fine. morning. You'll be fine. Coming up next on Pregnancy for Dummies. The first trimester is mostly a time of joy, but for a small percentage of couples, it can also bring some problems. It's always best to err on the side of safety when it comes to pregnancy. So if you notice anything unusual, don't hesitate to call the doctor. so nauseous that you can't keep anything down, either solids or liquids, and if that goes on for a couple of days, then you can get really dehydrated. So you should call your doctor if that happens. 
Bleeding is a lot more common than you would imagine. Up to one third of women will actually have some bleeding in the first trimester of pregnancy. And most of the time it's not a problem. Most of the time the pregnancy continues and no, nothing happens. Um, but if you are experiencing bleeding more than just a little bit of spotting or bleeding associated with cramping, it is a reason to call your doctor. Possible symptoms of a bladder infection are painful urination, a burning when you urinate, um, if you urinate more frequently than you, than you um, normally do. Um, if you develop a fever, um, it's something, it's one of the first things your doctor will look at is whether or not you have a bladder infection. Um, and bladder infections are important to treat during pregnancy, so you should call your doctor right away if you think that you might have one. Repeat the HCG. One of the hardest parts of the, being an obstetrician for me, I think, is when things don't go well. So telling somebody who um, has been looking forward to this pregnancy that the pregnancy is not going to be viable or won't continue or has had a miscarriage or is in the process of miscarrying is always a really hard thing to say. 70% of all women who have had you know, one miscarriage go on to have a completely normal, healthy pregnancy in their subsequent pregnancy. So we try to be encouraging to those patients and, and, and also we, we try to point out that really there's very, very little that, that a woman can do to cause a miscarriage. Often women try to blame themselves. Maybe it was something I ate or didn't eat or maybe it was you know, something I exercised too hard or whatever. Really those things are not, not significantly associated with miscarriage. So we try to reassure patients that it's not their fault. It's something that that they can't pre prevent. If you've experienced two or three miscarriages, it's definitely something to go talk to your doctor about because there are tests that can be done and treatment given to try to prevent a miscarriage from occurring again in the future. How are you feeling? Better. Starting to show. A bit. <laughs> Through with testing? For now. How'd everything go? So far, so good. How many weeks pregnant are you? 11 weeks, three days, two hours, and 17 minutes. And speaking of counting the days, Herb and Caroline are finally getting the results of the prenatal test that was done over a week ago. They're kind of anxious, because after years of dealing with infertility, they are at last expecting not just one, but twins. That's twice as much to worry about. Hello. Hi, Joanne, how are you? Good. Yes, everybody is here. Oh, she can't hear because she doesn't like picking up the phone when she gets news. So I'm the interpreter. Yes. Okay, thank God. Great. Oh, absolutely, we went on those taxes. Ha! I was right. <laughs> thank you. Okay, bye. She said they're both perfectly normal. You swear? I swear, I swear. And she goes, do you want to know the sexes? And I said, of course I do. And she goes, you have a boy and a girl. Yes. Now Caroline and Herb can breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> but they still have another hurdle to overcome. What to name those babies? Well, at least now they know the sexes. Their task should be a little easier. Hi, no problems. A boy and a girl. Our journey through the first trimester of pregnancy has come to an end. And aside from a few unpleasant side effects, it's been relatively smooth sailing. Pregnancy for Dummies got us through that first doctor visit. We heard the baby's heartbeat, and we navigated our way through prenatal testing to a happy conclusion. But hey, this is just the beginning. We've got 26 more amazing and exciting weeks to cover as Pregnancy for Dummies takes you from here to maternity. Oh, oh yeah, and Wendy will be there too, <laughs> along with her growing belly. You look cheerful. I've got some great news. It's a boy! Wow. <laughs>